the title is Memories and Depictions of Jews in the Holocaust. Sorry, no worries. Memories and Depiction of Jews and the Holocaust, and we have two uh, panelists who are students of mine, and so Megan Sebi was in my um, senior seminar, Holocaust in American Memory, last year, and Tej Lashinsky was, or is, currently doing independent study project with me, as well as um, he was in my History of the Holocaust class last year. So I'm thrilled that they are here, and um, both of them have been great work. So I will we'll start with Megan, and her um, topic is Psychological Trauma from the Holocaust and its Role in Survivor Identity in America. Thank you for saying that one title oh. for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, like Professor Simon says, I was in her class last semester, and I really enjoyed it because I'm a public policy major in James Madison, so it's sort of outside the realm of what I usually get to do, and so I was really excited to learn more and new things. I learned a lot. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so just to start out, uh, this is my thesis. Sorry, it's so long. Um, the trauma of the Holocaust caused a splitting of the consciousness of survivors into the Holocaust self and the non-Holocaust self. Initially, Holocaust survivors were denied the option to live in America with their Holocaust self, which impeded their psychological healing. However, in the 1980s, American society opened up to the ideas of mental illness and survivorship which uh, allowed Holocaust survivors the opportunity to exist as survivors and to heal. Also, I'm sorry, I'm being a little sick, so bear with me there. Okay, so just to start out with, I started with a sort of broad analysis of genocide, trauma, and social death. Um, so genocide is an attack on the entire self, both internal and external. Internal being your life, it's an attack on, on your very life, and then external is the, you know, it's the culture, it's the identity, it's the language, it's your family, your friends, all the traditions, everything. So the external um, genocide sort of began, before the final decisions began in 1933, um, with the first discriminatory policies. And then they, um, broadly about trauma as well, going hand in, side, hand in hand with genocide, trauma is a rupture in the psyche, and it is really identity altering, especially to such a magnitude. Um, so even though many aspects of the person will remain, um, like in the Holocaust, uh, Jews were forced to be people that didn't want to be. They were forced to do things, experience things that they didn't want to experience, that no one should ever have to experience. Um, so that really forcibly changed the bounds of their identity, and it sort of, I mean, it shattered worldviews. Um, so their entire thought process, their entire identity was permanently altered by the Holocaust. And so then, that brings me to this idea of social death, um, which became really crucial to my, to my argument. So in a genocide, the harm members suffer is a loss of context and identity that gave meaning and shape to their lives and would have given meaning to their deaths. Um, so social death is the death of social vitality, and that is sort of like the, the external factor of the genocide. It's where you, it's where you find your meaning in life, and in that, that thing on the right there, I have this this quote that really summarized my framework very well, saying, putting social death at the center of genocide takes the focus off body counts, individual careers cut short in mourners. It puts the focus instead on relationships, connection, and foundational institutions that create community and set the context that gave meaning to, co to careers and goals, lives and deaths. Um, and so this is really my framework for the, for the research um, because the class was on Holocaust survivors in America, so obviously it's people who survived the Holocaust, and so then I talk about how how their survival was impacted and what it meant to be a survivor in America. So some psychological effects, still pretty broadly speaking, um, with the long-term damage. Um, chronic stress, especially to the magnitude of the Holocaust, deregulates stress response systems, so it erodes the threshold for reactivity and adaptive responding. Adapt, adaptive responding. So really when you experience trauma, especially so young, and many Holocaust survivors were, were younger, um, it puts you at an increased risk for further psychological distresses. And so then the splitting of the self, which is also a very central part to my argument, um, a lot of scholars have studied the memory that Holocaust survivors have and how a lot of times there are gaps in memories. And so at first I thought that um, maybe like the Holocaust was just so bad, like the brain and like an act of self-preservation like didn't remember anything, just like blocked the whole thing out. But then the more the more I read and the more I read especially survivor testimonies, I sort of came to the conclusion that I mean Charlotte Delbo came to it first, but um, I agree with her first that in order in an act of self-preservation, the brain didn't not 
wire Holocaust memories into the brain, it sort of created a separate consciousness within the brain to store these really, really traumatic memories. So during the Holocaust, um, these victims, if they ever wanted any sort of chance at being able to, re to survive, to rebuild a life, they needed to not have to deal with that all the time. And so this quote from Charles here says, we are born with a safety valve, a system through which we become numb to pain and nor to means that are unmanageable. Uh, this safety valve enables us to survive the unsurvivable. So Charlotte Delbo, who is a Holocaust survivor, she named these different consciousness, common memory and deep memory. Common memory is what we would think of as normal memory. It's where, it's where you live, and this remembers the Holocaust from a really external view. So it was, when they remember in, in the common memory, it's more like the Holocaust happened to a dear friend. Like it's something that's very sad, but they can, they can still move on, they can experience their lives. And then the deep memory, that's where, that's where the real trauma is, and it's transcendent. So if they remember it in deep memory, all, all of the emotion, all the experience of the Holocaust is in that moment. And so it's very traumatic, and, um, and sorry. Um, so most people have tried to stay within common memory. And then for a variety of reasons, um, some people have more or less division between common memory and deep memory. Um, some people, my favorite example is a Hungarian survivor. He learned English before the Holocaust. He was so fluent. And then after the Holocaust, he started learning English again, completely forgot that he learned and became fluent in an entire language. So his distance between common and deep memory was so great that even his pre-war memories were compromised. Um, most people have like a decent barrier between common and deep memory um, that gets weaker as they age, unfortunately, but they, they're able to move on with their lives, maybe get married, have kids, have a career, stay busy, um, and then they can do that, and then deep memory will come out in infrequent dreams or just whenever they experience like a Holocaust-specific trigger. Um, and then some people didn't have sufficient distance between common and deep memory, and those are the people that you don't hear about as much, um, with some notable exceptions, um, like Primo Levi, Jean Memory. Um, and these are the people who most often ended up uh, dying by suicide, taking their own lives, or institutionalized for years. Um, so it's important to have enough space between common and deep memory, because it's the only way they can survive. And then some people, another smaller subset, um, sort of started existing in no memory. They just shut everything off. It was um, one survivor psychologist called it a psychic closing off, where in order to avoid deep memory, they just they shut off all emotion. There was no there was no moving on. There was no no remembering, no anything. Um, so a lot to, <laughs> a lot for everyone to deal with. So, which brings me to the importance of remembering, though. Remembering is really really crucial for mental health. Um, humans have this innate desire to be known, and I don't mean just like remembering like alone at night, because um, that's not the good kind. Um, but having like a really vested and compassionate audience, um, being able to listen to it's it's very important for sorry um, for just feeling respected and valued. Um, and it was also a tool for many people to honor lost loved ones. And you can see I bolded the part of that quote at the bottom that opposing such difficult truths can literally. Uh, drive a person mad just because everyone has this has this need to be known and which brings me to the importance of belonging which was ended up being more central to my argument than I kind of anticipated so remember after after the Holocaust ended there was this goal of rebuilding social vitality um, which is what gives meaning to life so in order for, for social vitality to be built you need need to belong. So, and there are two critical components of belonging, the experience of being valued and the experience of fitting in through shared characteristics. Um, and so for Holocaust survivors, this means that their social circle must acknowledge both common and deep memories and validate ongoing pain. And I argue that in America, um, especially from the 40s to the 80s, it got better in the 80s, that neither component was fulfilled, which prevented Holocaust survivors from being able to fully rebuild that social vitality that they would need to, um, to give full meaning to their lives. And so I identified four possible avenues of belonging for Holocaust survivors, the first one being American society, the second one the field of psychology itself, um, the third one family and friends, and I take a special look at Jewish Americans, um, and then another avenue being other survivors. So we'll start with American society. So like I said, the 40s and 50s, 
we're, we're not a great time to be a survivor in America. Um, generally, American society as a whole had been, like they were, they were over it, like we won, move on, you know? Like there was an economic boom, a baby boom, the GI Bill, like straight white Americans were having a really good time. Um, but so, survivors, there was still anti-Semitism in America. Um, I read, one of my sources reported that in April of 1945, 45% of Americans were mildly anti-Semitic and five to 10 were rapidly anti-Semitic. So remember, part of belonging is that you need to be that, like valued and like sort of fit in, not that everyone has to think and believe the same, but that you have to be respected. And that was not, that was not given to Holocaust survivors. So they had to deal with anti-Semitism. And then they also, oh, sorry, sorry that second part is a little messed up. There's this survivor syndrome. So there was no real idea of long-term yeah, like damage from trauma. Um, if any, the closest that people came was survivor syndrome, and that was perpetuated by a lot, a lot of well-intentioned psychologists and arguably intentioned liberators. And it was focused entirely on pity, like, oh, they could, you know, like I could never come back from that. Like, there's no, there's no hope for them essentially, which is not good. Um, and then in the 60s and 70s, there was a bit of a cultural shift with the Vietnam War especially, and then feminist and civil rights movements. Um, there's this idea, there's this shift from being a victim to being a survivor, and that your circumstances did not define your humanity, um, and that some circumstances were terrible enough to have lasting effects on people. But it still wasn't until the 1980s um, that Holocaust survivors were really part of that conversation. In 1976, um, Terence Dupre published his book, The Survivor, uh, which celebrates survivors' moral fiber and resiliency, which was good because it reduced the stigma around being a survivor and it gave people the opportunity to share their stories and be able to remember. Um, but it was bad because in his big celebration of celebrating the resiliency, it expected Holocaust survivors to have moved on to be fine. Um, which we know is not true, um, and it only further alienated people who had not, who had not all the way moved on. And then in 1980, the um, American Psychiatric Association, Psychological Association, released the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the third version, um, which if you don't know, the DSM is considered to be like the Bible of psychology. And so in that, they included PTSD, which originally was just, you know, for Vietnam veterans, but like I said, it started including victims of rape, and then it also, not really on purpose because there's still anti-Semitism, but it did end up including um, Holocaust survivors. So in 1980, um, survivors did finally have the ability to acknowledge that their trauma had lasting effects, but that a really big part that a lot of survivors stress in their testimonies, that trauma and normalcy can exist at the same time, that even though they have this thing that this terrible thing that happens to them and that keeps following them, that, that doesn't mean that they can't. So, yeah, they had to strike a balance and it took decades to even get close. Um, so then, the next one is the field of psychology. Um, so hopefully, you know, you'd hope that they would know and be able to help survivors. Um, but there was still a big stigma around mental health, especially in the 40s and 50s. Um, it was some, like even psychologists themselves experienced stigma and so if you, um, so that sort of deterred a lot of people from going. And also psychology was a relatively young field that was extremely <coughs> shaken up by the Holocaust. Um, even like the psychologists had to sort of like deconstruct their whole worldview, just if they wanted to be able to help at all, they had to do their own grappling with the Holocaust. And a lot of them were not willing or able to do that, um, which I'll touch on more in a minute. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the psychological frameworks of the mid to late 90s, um, at the end of the Holocaust, uh, psychoanalysis developed by Freud, uh, who was an Austrian Jew, died in 1939. Um, but psychoanalysis was the one they had, and it centered around making the known unknown, so sort of discovering sources of trauma from like deep in your subconscious, and it sought to sort of attribute post-war, um, like mental, dis psychological distress to pre-war, um, issues, so psychoanalysis has, has some good things, but then with the common and deep memory, like Holocaust survivors 
knew where their trauma came from. There was no sort of having to like dig it up, like, oh, because your mother was emotionally distant before the war. Like, that wasn't it. Um, so <laughs> so some, some psychologists sort of did realize that that was not um, exactly what they should be doing. But generally speaking, um, the Holocaust was not given sufficient or really any value as something that could in itself cause trauma. And the treatment of the time was either, um, you know, just get a job, make some friends, you're here now, you survived, you're fine, or you could be institutionalized, which also sort of deterred people from wanting to go. Um, but then in the 60s and 70s, um, psychology kind of switched to the biomedical model, which believes that mental disorders are biologically based brain diseases. So it's closer. Um, but it does not account for any ongoing social or environmental factors, um, such as a sense of belonging that these survivors were still not experiencing in America that was preventing them from rebuilding their social vitality and getting full meaning back to their lives. So then around the 1980s, when there was a big year, um, the biopsychosocial model um, sort of came out, it was introduced in 1977, and it provides a holistic view of mental well-being that takes into account the interactions, um, sort of as the name implies, between the biological, the psychological, and the social frameworks and how those all interact within a person. And it had less of the power imbalance of previous frameworks, so instead of, you know, your psychologist just telling you where your trauma came from and what to do, it sought to reach a shared understanding, which was really good for survivors because for, like, the first time ever, they were able to be in control of their own narrative and have people listen to them and respect what they're saying and not just sort of listen to respond and to diagnose. Um, but then psychological frameworks aside, like I sort of mentioned before, psychologists were not prepared to deal with the Holocaust. It was such a, like there's no, there's no way to find meaning in it and a lot of them um, really struggled with that with being able to help. So part of it was they didn't have, you know, they weren't taught the frameworks, but part of it was just like having to bridge that gap between being a survivor and not was just um, it was just too much for most. Um, some, some psychologists did do a good job, they were able to help, but um, by and large it was not um, a place of good belonging for Holocaust survivors. Um, but then within that, survivors were reluctant to seek help for four main reasons. Um, like I mentioned before, the stigma, and then the second one was fear because they were afraid of weakening the barrier between common and deep memory which would cause them to sort of lose their already tenuous grip they have on this um, social vitality that they have built up. And then three is the vulnerability involved in psychological treatment. Um, they would be exposing themselves before a superior, superior observer again, um, which could be triggered and just remind them too much of the Holocaust when they were forced to be so exposed in front of people. And then the fourth one is the shame be associated with not being able to escape the Nazis' influence. So for most survivors, um, being able to rebuild your life, like that was the victory, that was the, like, you know, you didn't quite get us. Um, and they found strength in their normalcy, and so to admit that even though they had been able to survive and they'd been able to rebuild, that the Nazis still had this sort of influence over them, um, would have been seen as a very, a very shameful thing for them. Okay, so the next one, um, oh goodness, okay, and so I'm almost done actually, <laughs> okay. So the next one is the friends and family, um, and then American Jews, so friends and family, could have been um, a good support, um, a good avenue of support, but um, most survivors did not want to be seen as a burden um, on their friends and family and did not want to traumatize their children. Um, this quote by survivor of their Ruth Bondi says, why impose on your nearest and dearest that, I mean, she summed it up well. Um, and then just a little bit then about American Jews. It was sort of mixed reviews on like how much belonging they provided because on one hand, um, American Jews did not you know, they, they didn't, they couldn't understand the, the scope of the Holocaust, and a lot of survivors were, you know, said that they didn't even ask, they didn't even try to learn, like, along with most of American society, they were ready to just close that chapter and sort of, you know, everyone, have everyone move on with their lives. Um, and then one survivor said that um, she was talking to an American Jewish friend who compared the Great Depression to the Holocaust, and so there's just sort of a breach in this community. Um, but they were still able to, to find a home in the shared religion and tradition and that sort of, you know, transcend like time and location. So they could still have that. And it was also a refuge from anti-Semitism. So they did have belonging as Jews that they couldn't experience in some American society. Um, 
even if they didn't have full belonging as survivors. Um, and then the fourth uh, possible avenue of belonging was other survivors, which I, they, they enjoyed um, hanging out to each other, <laughs> hanging out with each other um, and talking, but they also learned really quickly to not bring it up um, just because causing a breakdown between common and deep memory is traumatic and survivors know it better than anyone else if they didn't want to cause anyone else to go through it. So I mean in the simplest terms, it was the blind leading the blind. It was a great place of belonging, but they could not they could not help heal each other. And so that my final slide brings me to why this is important. So the Holocaust is the worst genocide in American history and even though we say never again, other genocide, other mass traumas have and will continue to happen. Um, but we do know more now than we did then. So recently within psychology, there's been a call for culturally competent care, which is when the psychologist and the patient share key demographics that allow them to relate in a way that others cannot, and which gives the psychologist better insight into the life and past and ongoing problems of the patient. But that is not always possible, especially when you're talking about genocide. Um, American psychology did have this idea at the time that we should get people who can relate, so they got you know, German-American, Polish-Jewish-American psychologists all to try, but very, very few of them were survivors. Um, just, I mean, logistically, very few of them were able to be survivors. So it was, there was still this big gulf, even if they had other, other shared demographics. The, the main defining factor was that one of them was a survivor and one of them was not. Um, so that is, that's difficult to get over. Um, and then, so one thing, we can do, I guess. I know I don't have any like policy thing, like anything, like anything really concrete. Like it feels anticlimactic, but just being able to provide survivors of any genocide, any mass trauma, with a sense of belonging, will really help. Like give them a good foundation on which they can build their social vitality, on which they can find their meaning. And that's especially important as survivors age, because as you get older, I mean, one of the things that we're able to keep them in common memory was that they were busy, they had kids, they had jobs. It's, you know, it's easier to sort of push away, but as they get older, they retire, their kids move away, and then also their mind is weakening, they're getting dementia, that sort of thing. It really, the barrier between common and deep memory really, really weakens, and so that's a very vulnerable time. Um, so consistent care over the whole lifetime, consistent validation of past and ongoing trauma is really, really important to being able to care for people. Here's some of my references. <laughs> So hi everyone, uh, my name is Mateusz Szczyszynski and uh, my topic was Poland, Poland nation building and the role of the Polish youth. So for my objective for this research, my motivation mainly came from uh, challenging the idea that the rise of anti-Semitism specifically in Poland is due to this uh, resistance to neoliberalism that is occurring throughout Europe and throughout the world at the moment. While it holds truth in certain cases, I argue that it's, it's not necessarily why Poland's doing this. And then uh, another one of my motivations came from the idea that, I, I was really irked by the idea that uh, people say that Poland rewrites its history or is uh, revising its own history. Because I just, I just didn't feel like that's the proper way of stating it. The, the situation in reality is that this history existed way before this year or 2015 when the migrant crisis were occurring. This has been going on for generations, and it's that's where my my goal came in, where um, to show this continuity of this kind of reaction to Polish Jews. I look into the uh, Second Republic of Poland, which was in the interwar period, and then I look into the Third Republic of Poland, which is the current uh, state. And I chose these two because they were the the independent states rather than the People's Republic and the occupied Poland, because there's other influences that go into. So, so looking at uh, just general idea of the Second Republic at the moment, um, 
If we look at the ethnicities and relations, uh, it shouldn't be surprising that Poland wasn't actually homogenous at that period. There was multiple nations of people in what is considered a second republic. Uh, this is kind of a bad map because it doesn't have everything on it. It just states that there's Poles, Poles, uh, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Czechs, Lithuanians, Germans, but, and this is a linguistic map. It's missing a lot of other languages, Yiddish, Hebrew, uh, the Kashubians on the bottom. So there's an example where you can see the, what you'll see in a moment, the disappearance of history. But uh, interactions between Poles and Jews, it varied depending on where you were located it, located at. So cities like Łódź, Warszawa, Częstochowa, these cities will have lots of interaction. You'll have a lot of Polish Jews that are, have intermingled with the ethnic Poles. And, but on the other side, there are situations where there are more isolation, isolationist uh, Jewish communities, which then are targeted by ethno-nationalist Poles. So uh, at this period, let's say around like 1870s, 1880s, you have this rise of Polish Romanticism. It's another period of time where Poles recognize this. This is our, another chance for us to get independence. So you have Romantic writers such as Bolesław Prus, you have Aleksander Szwedkowski, and they basically write talking about how we can integrate the people that live in the Second Republic and we can create this multicultural system in where everyone can thrive and be considered as the Polish nation. Our, in uh, around the 1880s, you have this growth of anti-romanticism, you have the growth of uh, nationalism, and this rise of anti-Semitism kicks in yet again. And you have pogroms in, uh, in Warsaw in 1881, a thousand Jews become homeless. Social unrest in Woods, where about 600 people died, uh, around 500 were Jewish. And this is the eve of World War I, so a lot of people start recognizing that uh, nation states are gonna start rising and the empire is gonna start falling apart. And that's where you have people like Bolesław Prus and Aleksandr Skrzykowski uh, switching sides. You know, they're, they're famous for the writings of being romantics about having this multicultural system. But on the other side, which people actually recognize is they do a 180 flip and start talking about how the only way Poland can thrive is through an ethno-nationalist state and that um, the threat of a Poli or a Jewish uh, nationalism can destroy a future Polish state. So we're gonna look at two people that really uh, forced or uh, motivated the political system of Poland. You have on your, uh, on your right you have Józef Kosudski, uh, the, the considered Marshal of Poland, and then you have on your left Roman Domofsky. He is the uh, prime politician who spoke for Poland in the Versailles Treaty. So Pilsudski controlled the multi-ethnic camp. It's considered the uh, sanatia, sanation, or the cleansing. Um, he's considered the great eminence of Poland because he doesn't necessarily ha have like a political stance. He he's just there when he feel like when he feels that uh, Poland's in danger. He goes into Warsaw, marching with his troops, and takes over for a period of time. And so he ran PPAS, which is the Socialist Party of Poland. He ran Polish Legion, which was the Polish Army of Prussia. Then he ran BBVR, which is what is now the most famous Sanatia group. So it's important to realize that these people were nationalists. They were fighting for an independent country. What, what kind of form of nationalism they take is depending on how they view uh, the future of Poland. So Pilsudski takes the civic nationalism and it's this romantic view of, we're gonna go back to the Commonwealth, we're gonna create a unified system with the Ukrainians, with the Belarusians, and uh, with Poles, and create what was the Commonwealth before. Um, and his power even exceeds on May 26, when uh, there's a coup, the uh, nationalist group, which I'll talk about later, was in power, and he felt that they needed to be uh, removed because it was a danger to his ideals. So his relations with Polish Jews, uh, it's mainly positive uh, through primary sources like letters that many uh, Polish Jews wrote to him. They talk about, uh, they write it actually in Yiddish, which is kind of important in fact, because it's, it's this uh, feeling of connection between him that they feel safe, that they can write to him in a different language than Polish, and they can stress their uh, critiques about the Polish state. Because there's 
you know, there are people who wrote and talked about like uh, I need a loan from uh, from the Polish government and then they'll praise it and stuff like that. But then you have cases where they'll write in Yiddish or they'll write in Hebrew and state that they don't like what's happening in Poland and they'll say it straight to him and write letters to him about it. Then you have the Jewish Labor Bund. It was a giant organization or a social movement that became a larger organization over time. The, they, they didn't necessarily want to integrate with Poland, but they understood that their state more than likely will be Polish rather than Israel. So there was this mutual understanding that Pilsudski is going to protect them if, uh, if they support the Polish state. And here's a quote from him, and it's his quote when he was in Lithuania, talking about uh, the multicultural system, he states, the less anti-Semitism there is among Christians, the easier it will be to unite the social forces, Jews, Poles, Lithuanians, we are all equally exploited by our own domestic exploiters, we are equally hurt by the Moscovite government. So on the other side of the situation is Roman Domofsky's camp. There are the ethno-nationalists, he ran the, he's the founder of the National Democrats, which are called the Endatia, and they have the National Par uh, Party. And you see this uh, question rise with him. It's this idea like what to do with the Polish Jews, because in, in uh, Domofsky's manifestos, um, he recognizes that there's an internal enemy in Poland, and that internal enemy is the Polish Jews. So he had two options that he writes about in his manifesto. It's either emigration or being killed for the Polish Jews. And this is in his Myślenie Nowoczesnego Polaka. So, um, yeah, so he, the reason why he's the most famous out of any other ethno-nationalist is that he politicized the situation. He brought it to the mainstream. Like he didn't never had a political power as Pilsudski had. He did, um, he, he was the ideologue that motivated everyone else to follow his lead. So in 1935, Pilsudski dies, and essentially the Sinatra camp uh, falls apart, which allows the ethno-nationalists to take over, and uh, the radical branch becomes a camp of national unity, and you see this progression of anti-Semitic actions, starting with literature, you have newspapers speaking about the, Polish, uh, the Jewish problem in Poland, and you have uh, protests in college campuses, uh, radical groups like the National Radical Camp, ONR, start targeting Polish Jews, uh, bombing their stores, uh, harassing them in college campuses, or trying to kick them out of uh, college campuses. And then another important part is this Im immigration plan. Um, it seems like uh, more of a, just a fact saying that, oh, there were plans to uh, emigrate these Jews, but in reality, this, is, this was a serious case because po Poland took this really seriously. The famous ones are purchasing Madagascar for France. Uh, they tried to purchase uh, Angola from Portugal. They made deals with uh, Britain to get the Sinai or the Palestine and then to send all their Polish Jews there. And this went on until a month before World War II started. And it just shows you how, how complex and like how motivated the ethno-nationalists were to kick out Polish Jews, even when they knew that war, the war was going to begin. So just to get a better understanding of the situation, uh, here are some quotes from ethno-nationalists. Uh, the bolder ones are pre predominantly the most important. It's from Roman Dmowski in his uh, manifesto and his magazine. So he his belief in Polish Jews is that a small amount of elements from the Jewish theme, a strictly defined amount, we shall choose from them, and what is strong for us, what is closest to us, and that is the most similar to us. So he had some leniency of accepting Polish Jews, but then he, then again, he really contradicts that idea further by saying even the very best Jews, the most assimilated with the Poles, neither think nor feel nationally. So there's a serious issue where uh, the ethno-nationalists are, are almost paralleling what is occurring in Nazi Germany at the time. As you see on the bottom one, uh, that's uh, Prostis Mostu is uh, a famous ethno-nationalist uh, newspaper during that time. And uh, Karol Zbizewski is stating that Hitler's repression is necessary. And then he makes this argument that uh, if 
this can happen in war, why can't it happen during peacetime? So putting it all together in the Second Republic, uh, this question what to do with Polish Jews during that time. Ultimately, the Second Republic solution becomes emigration with those five or so different areas they were looking at. This doesn't occur, World War II starts. Um, Pilsudski does, however, arguably succeed in controlling uh, the Polish uh, state during his lifetime, but he was just a man, so once his uh, death came, his system would fall apart. But then you have Andatsia's belief in uh, what, what the role of Polish Jews is in Polish government that uh, caused uh, or uh, foreshadowed what was going to occur in the future uh, Polish days. So then we move into Occupy Poland and the uh, People's Republic. So again, oh, yeah, that's so, sorry, okay. All right, so um, I didn't really focus on this part because again, there, this is not an independent Poland state. So a lot of the influence does not necessarily come from, uh, from Polish government. But you have three factors that are really important in this uh, time period. So you have the, the issue of collaboration of Poles. So, Poles uh, have taken part in the Holocaust in all sorts of different ways. But then you have this uh, growth of the anti-Zionist movement occur in Poli the Polish People's Republic. It creates this uh, sense of dual loyalty, where is basically once uh, Beirut, which was the first Polish um, leader of the Polish People's Republic, was kicked out. You have Gamuka who came in and basically began, or began this anti-Zionist movement where uh, it is believed that you can't be Polish and Jewish at the same time because there's an Israel now, so you gotta choose one. And that's where you have a situation where uh, mass immigration occurs in 1968 as uh, the Polish government and uh, the Polish people start kicking out some of the, the Jews or forcing them to emigrate. So here, uh, there's a photo where it says Zionism uh, to Israel, and it's one of the protests. Another issue is uh, the population. So by the end of World War II, the Polish Jewish population decreased at 90%. By 1950, there was only 30,000 Jews. That's where you have this transition from Gamuka's a Stalinist uh, Poland into more of a or by roots, Stalinist Poland to uh, Gomułka's more nationalistic communism. And by 1970, there's about uh, 25,000 Polish Jews, and that's when it's considered this idea that Poland has become homogenous. So then you have the reclamation, uh, Third Republic of Poland. So this is in 1988, 89 and 1990, where the Solidarity movement starts to occur. So the transition movement starts. You have um, a movement from communist system to a democratic uh, capitalist system, which causes social anxiety. Uh, for a lot of Poles, they assume that once we switch to capitalism, uh, our troubles will go away and we'll, we'll become wealthier, we'll have the means that Western Europe has. But this doesn't occur as due to the shock of capitalism in the situation. So the blame falls on Polish Jews at that moment. So statistics show in 1990, about 20% of Poles disliked Jews, 15% liked, uh, liked Jews, and 65% were indifferent. But it's also important to note of, um, you might say that you don't, you don't have any hatred for the Polish Jews or for any uh, Jewish people, but your actions mean differently. So there's, there's obviously that, um, the, the number possibly and more likely is higher than just 20% at that moment. Um, so yeah, 1991, another survey was taken and it showed that about 26% of Poles felt that Jews had too much power in Poland. It's also important to recognize there's only 25,000, by now there's only like 10,000. And in 1991, uh, about 16% of Poles saw Jews as outsiders. That goes back to this old communist version of dual loyalty to Israel and Poland. So early politics, um, you, you have this use of anti-Jewish uh, slogans in uh, political campaigns. You'll see even the most famous Lech Walesa, the Movement of Solidarity, uh, question his rivals about their Jewish lineage. He won't necessarily say that, um, 
that's a bad thing, but he'll question saying, well, you're Jewish and you should acknowledge your past and just to push that idea out so the ethno-nationalists can take on it. Um, so you have this fight between the Solidarity Center Alliance and the Citizens Movement for Democratic Action and a call for pureness occurs, like the politics of Poland need to be pure of, of any other minority besides Poland or Poles. But uh, you have this change occur when uh, over time you move into the 2000s, it's this EU multiculturalism that kind of mimics the, the idea of what Pilsudski was looking for. And Poland achieves membership to the European Union in 2004, and before that it joined NATO. So you have this now transfer from Pilsudski's political party style of multiculturalism to a gigantic EU system taking control of what Poland's multiculturalism will look like, compared again to just the ethno-nationalistic community that's still harboring hatred. Uh, so there's this creation of a contradiction in the Polish system. You have ethno-nationalists who want a, a pure Poland, a, a, a Poland for Poles, but at the same time they're working in a system that just utterly contradicts this idea. You have free movement, you have uh, a unified citizenship across the EU, so it just, it just doesn't work in that sense. On a domestic level, um, Poland around 1997 starts putting in minority rights into their penal codes. So uh, those were specifically targeted for Polish Jews. And in 2005, you have the election of Aleksandr Kwasniewski, which is uh, like a marking point where you see this ethno-nationalist argument starting to be um, become irrelevant as uh, Aleksandr uh, Kwasniewski's family had possible ties to, uh, his, his mother had possible ties to Jewish uh, heritage. And you would see like uh, ethno-nationalist groups like Radio Maria and Honor and his uh, uh, rivals saying that uh, he's a Jew, he can't be here, he can't be running for politics. But once elections come, that just fails. And it brings this point where this realization that you know, maybe the ethno-nationalists don't actually have the power they had once. And it, also it's important to notice, there's this hidden uh, Jewish generation, the revitalization of Polish Jews once a Poland becomes part of the EU and becomes a democracy again. Um, a lot of Poles start recognizing that they have a past uh, that relates to uh, the Jews and it's just not pure as they think it is. So, and you have writers, Jan Gross works, neighbors, becomes a vital part before Jan Gross, he had Jan Blonsky, who's a Polish writer, um, and he writes the ma or book, The Poor Pole Looks at the Ghetto, which is his own biography about meeting uh, a Jewish, a uh, little Jewish kid who escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto, and he did not help him out, and he has severe guilt for that. So the battle becomes uh, the presence of the past. Uh, the battleground becomes memories. It's no longer what to do with the Jews, it's how to remember them. Uh, the biggest uh, cases of that situation are Auschwitz and the Yedwabin massacre. So in Auschwitz, you have this argument like, what kind of narrative will Auschwitz be? Is it going to be a Polish one or is it going to be uh, a Jewish one? Or it could be a shared one. But um, the, the, narrat uh, the narrative turns into a battle between the two. So. Um, you have a situation where in the communist era you had Poles recognizing this is a Auschwitz is a hallmark for Poland because at that time the only visitors to Auschwitz were mainly uh, from the Eastern Bloc. But 1990 came and you have more tourism and the narrative starts switching to the current mainstream system. And the backlash turns into uh, the War of Crosses. You have ethno-nationalist groups going to Auschwitz, starting uh, covenants of nuns. You start seeing these, as the picture shows, multiple crosses in the area. And you just have this argument that they're trying to depolonize the situation or depolonize Auschwitz. And same goes in the Yedwabin massacre. Here you have uh, ethno-nationalists taking a more uh, defensive sta stance as um, Jan Gross pinpoints to the situation that um, Poles did collaborate. It, it's it's a serious issue. It happened, 
and um, you should acknowledge the situation. But uh, and you see Alexander Prashnevsky uh, stating that this is our issue. We should accept it, and we we uh, apologize for what occurred. He does this massive statement in the village after the nationalists attack him for being a servant of the Jews. And you have the return of this Judeo-Communism system, or argument that their ethnic nationalists are trying to push. So now, to the current time, you have ethnic nationalists. Yeah. Yep. So you have the Law and Justice Party, um, founded by Lech and Yaroslav Kaczynski. Um, the first victory occurred in uh, 2005 in their coalition campaign. The plan was to create a fourth republic. Nobody really knows what that meant. So, but that failed because once Poles started recognizing uh, what was occurring, they voted him out and called a quick snap election. Um, PIS, however, wins uh, again in 2015, and their whole goal is to stimulate patriotism, it's indirect anti-Semitism. So you have, uh, their actions are like threatening uh, to delegitimize historians, specifically Jan Gross, they tried to take his uh, merit awards out. And you have the most famous from right now, Holocaust laws. Um, it is, and they're trying to push this like separation between what is a Polish Jew, trying to separate the Polishness from the Jewishness of the situation. And you have the associates, what I, I would argue the, the more dangerous. You have on our Radio Maria, nationalist paper, and YouTubers. <coughs> and the most famous one that just came out, How to Spot a Jew, in uh, Tilko Polska, which was a film nationalist paper. And these are more dangerous because they, they don't necessarily care if they, they're that that direct about their situation. So, concluding thoughts. Um, I've been struggling with the situation. I don't know if Poland will have a melancholic future or optimistic future. It depends on how one views the situation. Yes, PIS, electoral base is still strong. Anti-Semitism inhibits Polish society still. Just yesterday, this comment came from a nationalist Politician, we will not stop until we have full pur fully purged Poland of people who are not worthy of belonging to our national community. And that was yesterday. Um, but there's also this idea of an optimistic future. The European Union's culture, political influence is just too strong for this occurring. And it's the idea that uh, ethno nationalists are on the defensive and this will end because this is their last hurrah of trying to stop what is occurring in multiculturalism. You also have uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski's health deteriorating. He's 69 years old. He's stuck in uh, the hospital for 37 days, and once he was gone, PIS was about to fall apart because nobody tried to take, everyone tried to take out control. So it's viewed that once he dies, more than likely this party's gonna fall apart. And you have this united opposition, and it's a situation where you have now communists, socialists, Democrats, conservatives, and certain other ethno nationalists creating into one unified party to combat against uh, PIS, so it's it's this overwhelming force that everyone just wants to get rid of PIS to end this situation, but ethno-nationalism will more than likely continue.